I think we need uh identify some scribes. Anybody want to do that? I can scribe for a bit, but I have to leave at the half hour point. Tell me okay. where you want me to scribe. I can since in the ADD meeting we had two two competing scribes that differed apparently by a difference in case. Mm. That annoying. So hi, this is Hank. Um, I uh, I understand that we rely on Brandon to be here because this is uh, uh, at least fifty percent about suit. But Brandon just informed me that he will be late, so he was in charge of slides. I uh, scraped the slides, and as uh, I thought he would present them, I now propose them as proposed slide to the data tracker. I know this is relatively last minute, but um, yeah, at least I was able to get them. So, yeah, right. And, so, uh, there, uh, Dave Thaler posted some slides to kind of you know, summarize the issues. Yeah, so, uh, and if we start uh, we with that, that. Uh, that, yeah, I saw, I saw the TIP requirement um, relevant, yeah, the other. Um, so, if you start with that, that's fine. And we can give Brandon some time to join in. Uh, later, I just wanted to highlight that uh, the, <clears throat> the slides Brent and I prepared are now as proposed slides on the data tracker for this interim, because that was my alternative route. Um, um, otherwise, I thought um, Brent would just present them or something. But again, it should be like 10 to 15 minutes as far as I know. He has been unresponsive afterwards, so I guess he's really there's something. I don't know. It's important. Uh, while we're uh, waiting, um... Hank wanted to reconvene the architecture design team starting next week to deal with, I can't remember what, Hank, now? Um, the only open issues that are left. So The only open okay. issues are left, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I um, uh, the, the 10 a.m. Tuesday is still of, is sort of available, or I can try to make keep it available for me. I just thought I'd ask in this... Uh, since we're, many of us are here. Um, um, if that's a okay thing. Okay with me. Oh, it's okay with me. Ned? Yeah, sounds good. All um, right. Where do you want me to scribe? Um, good question. Uh, so I don't, um, I, I think uh, we need to, so I don't think I, I, I don't have a, uh, a media echo, a media echo, uh, thought, uh, identified yet. So. Um, maybe we can do that last minute. Uh, well, I just uh, didn't want uh, to scribe in a place that no one knows. I'll, I'll, I'll make up a hedge. I'll hedge it off. Yeah, and... yeah. If you can do that, that would be so great. So there is, there is, there should be an option. There an official one? Yeah, there should be. I just haven't found uh, it yet. Let, let me check. I'll that find out. it. There's a Cody MD, right? Yeah, I'm presuming yeah, a hedgehog. Cody MD. Which is hedgehog now. And yes, um, um, there should be one. I found it. It is auto generated with the invite. I will uh, paste it into the chat. That's the, the link that yeah. the interim schedule points to is that link. I don't know if that's where you want it, but. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I have to do a jump to a hoop when I want to uh, post something in chat here. 
So just give me a second. And I'm almost at something that is a chat. There's a chat window, chat with everyone. And paste. Swoosh. So this should be the offer. Yeah, and there it is. Of course, you'll go faster. <laughs> Yeah, anybody who's always the IETF uh, data tracker page of all the intro meetings gets to that link as well as the the, the WebEx link. Exactly. I'm, I'm always going to upcoming meetings on the data tracker. It's all there. Yep. So uh, let's get started. Um, uh, so I ha uh, I have uh, slides uh, from um, Dave Taylor. Uh, maybe we can start with those. You can share those if you want, or you can share them, whichever. Uh, I didn't know if uh, you as the chair wanted to put up a note well or something slide first. Um, that would be a good idea. Yeah, and again, the uh, slides from Brandon, I uh, I pushed to the um, proposed slides um, through the proposed slides thingy because he's not here yet. Okay, so here's, uh, let me share the note well. There's nothing showing yet. Ah, no, it's not. I get the wrong thing. That's no, fine. It's uh, but it's a small window and a relatively big share. I can zoom in. Yeah, that's okay. Better, thanks. Okay, so uh, just a reminder: uh, uh, by participating in uh, ITF, you agree to the following ITF process and policies. Uh, if you're aware that any ITF contribution is covered by patents or patent applications that are owned or controlled by you or your sponsor, you must disclose that fact or not participate in the discussion as a participant in uh, or attendee to any IETF activity. You acknowledge that, that written audio, video, and photographic records of the meeting may be made public. Personal information that you provide to IETF will be handled in accordance with the IETF privacy statement. As a participant or attendee, you agree to work respectfully with other participants. Please contact the ombuds team uh, at the link if you have questions or concerns about this. Um, so that's our note well. And uh, from there we can move to sharing the content. If I'm up first, do you wanna share or do you want me to share? Uh, either, either way works. Uh, take me a second to find it, but I, I, I have that. it up, so I'm happy to. So it's, it's, okay. It's, why don't, it's, it's why don't you go ahead and share? Okay. okay. Am I sharing okay now, Ned? Uh, yep. Okay. 
Just go. I'm not in presentation mode. You're in. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, it's when I go into presentation mode, then it like switches. Okay, there we go. Hopefully, it's got yeah. the yeah. right view now. Right okay. around. Uh, all possible. right. So uh, this presentation is from the TEEP perspective, right? Because really, we have three different working groups that are relevant: rats, suit, and TEEP. And so this one is from the TEEP perspective, and I'm hoping that uh, Brennan's slides and stuff will cover from the SUIT perspective, which is in some sense wider than uh, than TEEP. But uh, here I'm going to be quoting out of the TEEP discussions. Okay, so what does TEEP require as opposed to what other cases would SUIT require? Which I think is I, I'm glad to hear that Hank and Brennan have uh, slides to to cover that part. Meaning uh, with my SUIT chair hat on, um, I would uh, I look forward to that discussion too. So. All right, so from a T perspective, and I see uh, we have uh, Nancy as a chair, and I see Hannes as one of the co-authors and stuff. So just to remind people about TEEP in uh, one slide, here's the relevant parts about TEEP in one slide. Okay, so first of all, the suit manifest format is used to express dependencies and reference, you know, firmware software updates and versions and the installation steps and so on. So TEEP depends on suit for that. TEEP is a protocol that's used for remediation when attestation fails. Where well, the attestation, the reason for the failure is seen to it being because a TEE or trust execution environment is currently out of compliance. So how do you get it back into a good state? And the answer is you use the T protocol and it's kicked off as a result of attestation failure. Okay. And so it needs enough information on the attestation failure, or at least in the evidence to be able to kick off what the right remediation steps are. Okay. So the TEEP protocol is defined to use um, EAT for attestation, although it does allow extensions. You could use something other than EAT, but the only thing that's sort of you know, standardized is the use of EAT in the protocol. Um, and it uses SUIT manifests for actually doing the uh, application of the updates. Okay. And so the TEEP is just the protocol that carries the SUIT manifest because SUIT does not specify a protocol. TEEP is a protocol that goes between a TEE and a trusted application manager. Okay. And so EAT claims are then used in the TEEP scenario to determine which suit manifests are applicable for remediating, right? So how does the trusted application manager know what suit manifest to push down to say, hey, you need to apply this particular thing, right? And so it's using the claims in the attestation. Attestation fails, I use the claims that result in the failure, and I use that to select which manifest or set of manifest to then push down into the into the TEE. Right. So this notion of remediation when attestation fails is not specific to uh, a TEE, right? So presumably there's analogy for some of these having nothing to do with TEEP, it's just remediation when out of compliance, right? If you were doing it with like the kernel or your BIOS or something like that, you wouldn't use the TEEP protocol, but you'll see that there's a lot of the same needs, right? But I'm only going to talk about the TEEP ones, but you should be thinking about, uh, and I think I have one bullet somewhere to show you how things generalize beyond TEEP, right? Because the claim is that these are not just TEEP requirements. These are TEEP requirements, but they're not just TEEP requirements. There are generalizations of them, okay? Last point is that the things I'll be quoting from come from the TEEP architecture document, which has already been submitted to the IEC for publication. So I can claim that there's been a TEEP working group consensus for quite a while now, um, as declared by Nancy and her co-chair. Uh, and it's been in that state for a while. I think it just went through AD review and we have some editorial things to follow up on, but it got working with consensus long ago. All right, so I'm gonna walk through three requirements of which my opinion is that two of, the, two of those requirements are relevant to this discussion and one of them is not. But for our completeness, I'm gonna show you all three classes of requirements. And because there's some interrelationship, I'd rather hold questions until I've shown you all three and then I'm happy to go back into what I'm, because they're, they're interrelated, right? So. I'm going to walk through them. I got uh, three requirements, one slide per requirement um, with some examples. So first one is a uh, class of device. Okay, so here's the actual quote. The following information is required for TPAT attestation, and it's in this paragraph on device identifying information, which includes some other things too beyond this requirement, right? Things like unique device identification. Okay, well, that's other requirements that are already met by other things, right? In particular, there's the bolded sentence, okay? And so this is, how do I know, that this is all in the context of how do I know which suit manifest to send to the device, okay? In some case, some use cases, it may be sufficient to identify only the class of the device, right? Not the unique device, right? Because I've got a suit manifest, not per device, but for, for a class of device, right? The following binary or installation steps or whatever are relevant to all the machines, that's, all the devices that meet the following criteria, or in this case, all the TEEs that meet the following criteria. 
So here's a couple of real world examples that are not in the document. Okay, but are things that have uh, come up in discussions or whatever uh, to tie it to like real world use cases. One example would be you have an SGX Enclave library that runs on any SGX2 capable Intel processor, right? Intel has lots of processors of different models and so on. And this is a uh, capability that each Intel processor version may or may not have. And so this SGX library, Enclave library is dependent on Intel, okay? And, but it's not dependent on any particular version or rever revision of things. It's anything that complies with the SGX2 uh, thing. Now, the same thing could be true of any other processor feature beyond the TE use case, but this example is, a, is the SGX2 processor case. And this is an example, unlike the other requirements, this is an example of a class that is actually within a particular manufacturer, right? So some Intel processors support SGX2, some don't. You could, there's a little bit more wider one. Some Intel processors support SGX in general, some don't, right? Um, and so this means that it's actually manufacturer specific uh, device class, right? So in this particular example, okay? And so that means that whatever the claim is, the actual value and the meaning of the value is up to the manufacturer, right? Because Intel is gonna be authoritative as to what it means to be SGX2 capable. And so this is an example of one that say Intel would request, oh, I need a particular value in a standard claim or they have to do some Intel specific claim to do this or whatever, okay? So again, requirement number one is an example where uh, you have a class across different processors from the same uh, manufacturer, okay? All right, so that's, that's how it will differ from requirement two. Requirement two, it talks about uh, TE identifying information. It talks about the type of TEE. And it says the same TEE type created by different manufacturers. Okay, so what does that mean? So here's some real world examples. Okay, so let's say you have a soup manifest that's a point that, that, that expresses dependency or expresses uh, the package of a particular version of Opti. Now, Opti is a uh, secure kernel using the term, sorry, a secure kernel or OS using the term loosely uh, that runs on Trust Zone on ARM Cortex A processors. Okay. Um, there's a specific spec that ARM puts out that any manufacturer that complies with that spec, um, this will run on. Okay, so in this case, the spec is a proprietary spec, but the manufacturer is not the owner of the spec, and there can be many manufacturers. So this is an example that says, I need something that complies with the you know ARM V8 architecture uh, and so on spec for, uh, from ARM, but any manufacturer, NXP, et cetera, are the manufacturers here. So this is not per manufacturer, the common thread on this one is there's actually a well-known spec that applies to it. Just my first example is one with a spec as a proprietary spec. Um, and yeah, Honest points out the specs themselves are public, right? But they come from a manufacturer. They come from ARM, not from a, uh, a standards org per se. But the spec is itself public and referenceable and so on. So thanks, Honest. Second example is where uh, RISC-V, which is not a company, it's a consortium. RISC-V puts out specs. And so some of our uh, T folks uh, that are uh, heavily involved in the specification and implementation are from the RISC-V community. And RISC-V also puts out specs on say, here's a version of a spec for TEEs and so on. And again, multiple manufacturers implement according to the spec, the particular arrival of a particular spec. And so you can say, here's a particular trusted app. And I don't know the specific example here, Akira or somebody would have a specific example of, uh, of a of one that they're using, um, which says that this uh, suit manifest depends on the ability to have uh, a RISC-V processor according to the following spec and rev. Okay. So this is one that is, again, not manufacturer specific, but this one is also the spec itself comes from a consortium, not a vendor. Like in the ARM case, it comes from a vendor. But both of them are kind of the, the same case, right? He says, I want a value that means a particular spec. Okay. And anything that complies with that spec, it applies to. Um, then there are things that are, uh, this is also generalizable to non-TE specific, right? You might say, I have a given image, and maybe this is something that will be in Brandon's presentation, given image that runs on, say, ARM Cortex-M processors from multiple manufacturers, right? And it's the boot image or something like that, right? And so for that, look towards, um, I'm guessing, Brandon Hank's presentation. But my point is, my expectation is that will have a similar requirement, if not the same requirement from a non-TE perspective to say, any device, any piece of hardware that conforms to a particular spec. So that's requirement two, which is things that are not manufacturer specific and have a spec. 
technically recurring number one, Intel probably has a spec too, but they're the only ones that implement it. And so the spec isn't, isn't as important because it's not one that's meant for implementers, right? It's more like a user guide or, or a uh, API guide for people writing apps on top of it. And then there's a third requirement that I claim is not part of this discussion, but I'll share it just to make sure we all agree it's not, okay? So in the same text here that I highlighted some text, I'm gonna highlight different text here. So it says T-identifying information. It talks about things like version identification information for hardware, firmware, and software version of the TEE, okay? So besides properties of the hardware, there's also things that are properties of, you know, the firmware or properties of the software that you depend on, okay? So this wouldn't be a hardware class ID. This would be more like a firmware or software class ID or something, okay? And so this could be considered to be a class ID, but in my own reading, my current belief is the current ability in each where you can use a SWID or COSWID um, already solves that particular requirement. And so I don't think there's any requirement here that is uh, not met that's part of the discussion around the, you know, draft bird calls suit rat claims document. I think that's one that uh, with the current version of the spec, my belief is that this one is already met. And we can concentrate just on requirements one and two, which again, have a lot of overlap. Uh, where my view was Lawrence's original per request would have met both requirements and one and two in the eat spec. Um, but wherever it goes, my point is that uh, there is a requirement. Here's some real world use cases, happy to take questions. And I think there's probably other manufacturers on the call that know better, so. All right, I think that's it. Uh, and unless there's questions and stuff for me, Ned. Okay. I had a question. Um, so, did you have you tried to, to draw a Venn diagram of the different ways in which things might be explained, particularly on two? Yeah. Um, no, because I don't didn't see a reason why a Venn diagram would be useful. So maybe I'm not understanding your question. Uh, um, well, so so I heard that there's a because there's a lot of overlapping things that 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 can be done. And the, the example you gave was that the Intel uh, SGX was uh, a specific manufacturer, whereas the risk was a class. Okay. And I'm wondering whether or not um, some of this is, could be more clearly generalizable mm -hmm. um, if we, uh, if we could see it more clearly. We would um, understand I'm why that how my interpretation of uh, Lawrence's pull request would have met both requirements one and two, if that would help. Okay. And I don't know if my if my interpretation is the same as what Lawrence had in mind, but since he wrote part of it maybe, based on my discussion, then I'm hoping we would actually agree. So maybe so. just better to let to proceed forward. Then I just wondered if yeah. anyone had tried. That's all. Uh, but yeah, my belief is that both one and two can be done with the same mechanism using a registry that anybody that develops a spec, whether it is a, um, whether it is a consortium like RISC V, whether it's a vendor like ARM or a manufacturer like Intel, right? As long as there's some uh, thing that they can do. And the other part of the question is, is, there, is, a, is a device only gonna have a single class ID? And the answer is no. The more interesting question is, is there only one per claim set, okay? Um, where it might be possible to say that there's only one per claim set and having one standard one, if you ever need multiple ones, you just use different claim sets, like the claim set for the TEE versus the non-TEE is a good example where I probably, would probably want to have multiple claim sets and that makes perfect sense. And so. Nodding my head in. Okay. I, I can't see you nodding your head, but thank you. For I, I know that's why I'm saying I you can't see me, so I'm nodding my head. Okay. All right. So I'm curious to know, uh, Hank or Brendan, uh, do we have uh, a, a suit view ready to go yet, or do we need to keep? I see Brendan is now on, so that's why I'm asking are they ready to go. Um, so they are, uh, and Brent already highlighted that there's uh, no explicit claim discussion in the, the slides we prepared. Um, I just wanted to highlight with respect to the class, hardware class, let's call it that. Um, there will be, a, I think the, uh, the, the problem with semantic interoperability is that if things are named very similar, people assume they are the same. And I am afraid this is not the case here. We have uh, three, uh, at least, at least from my point of view, comes springs to mind three domains where class, hardware classes or categories or something like that uh, uh, come into uh, effect. 
and that is identifying hardware as an intent in suit. That is describing and attesting or environments as in general that on the on the reference side of 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 uh, rats, and then the evidence of rats that that kind of tells you like a like an, a claim in evidence. Uh, by the way, I'm composed like this. So all of these are about hardware class, but they are not the same. <laughs> So yeah, I'm not going to do the term try. class. I tried to put the core term class in quotes in case the, the collection yeah. of working groups agreed on a different term. I personally don't care what the name is, right? Now that you understand. The hardware uh, configuration thing. Maybe a right. spec yeah. identifier yeah. or something. I don't know. That's kind of what the meaning is, right? So, so yeah, I have a take on this, yeah. and, and it's yeah, slightly ahead. different. Um, Please. My, my take on this is, is that what we really care about is compatibility. Um, and so really what we're looking at is uh, an, a notional compatibility identifier. And the thing is, it doesn't matter what it is. It really doesn't matter if it's, you know, a, uh, from a vendor or a consortium or a standard setting organization, none of it matters. It just identifies whether it, it's compatible or not. And if, so from a suit perspective, that's what we care about. We really don't care what it is we just care that it matches. Um, I would argue that in a rat's context, there's a similar sort of paradigm at play. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll lay out an argument for you and, and we can see if I've got it right. Um, if you have an opaque identifier and you don't know what it means, then you don't need to know its taxonomy. If you do know what the opaque identifier means, then you already know its taxonomy, which means that you do not need to transmit the taxonomy. That is redundant information. I would agree for what the same for the evidence side. So if evidence would include an environment identifier that is referring to some hardware component, and uh, then you are, uh, I, I guess, uh, thesis as holds. Yeah. So I, I, I think, Brandon, if I understand your argument, you're just explaining why you think whatever the value is, it can be treated as opaque for practical purposes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so, and, and I would agree, especially in the suit manifest case where you just want to know, will this firmware run on this system? Yes or no. If if. My my identifier is in the list of supported ones done. Right, but I think um, uh, there's an advantage of saying um, uh, I conform to the following spec rather than making the uh, other end um, try to match up across a very long list of you know processors or hardware IDs and things. It's easier to have a suit manifest that says anything that conforms to the spec, including future things, as long as it conforms to the spec. I don't have to enumerate the full list, right? So I, I don't buy that the list is that long, honestly. I, I, I don't. I, don't I really don't think is, it's that big. Yeah. And and then I would argue on top of that that this is something that a verifier can deal with. Um, and a tester does not need to deal with that because the verifier already knows the tester. Otherwise, how do they even have a relationship, a trust relationship? Um, sorry, if that's a question for me, I can give answers. Um, the uh, verifier may be dealing with a uh, large heterogeneous set of testers. Say um, all the machines in my enterprise. Okay, for some definition of enterprise, I mean, they may be IoT devices, they may be laptops, they may be whatever. Okay, um, but so the, it is a sorry, sorry, I, I just, relationship, right? I just need to understand though, because if that's the case, doesn't it need intimate knowledge of the attester? If it doesn't have intimate knowledge of the attester, how can it possibly be expected to assert its trustworthiness? Yeah, so the, the knowledge yeah, about the attester, the explaining attesters to verifiers does not happen by the attester. It can, there can be hints by the attester, but the attester cannot explain itself. It can only provide um, claims about it in evidence. So the, ex the explaining of attesters to verifiers happens via the endorsements and, and, and the reference values complement complementarily. So, so these are the things that will tell you the, the context about a hardware environment then. Right. So, 
I think there was one point that I think Brennan was making that if I understood it right, I agree with. Um, but let me just verify. Um, there's the entity that creates and signs the suit manifest, and there's the verifier, and those two entities can be different entities, different roles, or even different organizations, right? Uh, let, let me, uh, can I interrupt? Uh, so we we, yep. uh, we lost our, our note taker. Uh, so we need to, uh, before we can continue, we should be uh, taking notes. I can uh, volunteer to do that uh, if someone else wants to take over the chair duty or somebody else can volunteer. And this is Nancy. I can try and take notes, but I'll need help. <laughs> we okay. we still have a second, if not a third person as well, to help with the notes. <clears throat> so Nancy and somebody else want to volunteer? This is Russ. I'll pay attention. Thank you. So the notes. Okay. So. Uh, let us know when you're ready. We'll continue at that point. I'm in there. Go ahead. Well, okay. Um, I was saying there's two related things that I think Brennan is pointing out that they're different, but I think that they're related, right? One is what goes in the suit manifest and the suit manifest, um, in the remediation case, the suit manifest is designed to be processed by the same device that has the attester, right? And so whatever you put in the suit, manif suit manifest, the box that we'll call the attester for lack of a better box, well, back of, just for rats folks, we'll call it the attester box, uh, the attester device, is going to have to look at that suit manifest and verify, yep, I agree that this is actually relevant for me. So you got to put enough in the suit manifest for it to know that it's relevant to it. Um, then there's a separate <clears throat> piece that's what is in the verifier that says, is the thing actually up to date in compliance or whatever, or do I need to kick off a suit update? Okay. Uh, we on the same page so far, Brendan? Yes. So far, okay. so good. Okay. And what goes in the claims is for purposes of the verifier deciding whether you need a suit manifest or not. Uh, and then what goes in the suit manifest is for the attester to just verify that it got the right one that's applicable to it, right? Because it could have gotten it via more than just this protocol, you know, sneaker net, whatever, right? Um, and so the main purpose of this meeting is about what goes in the evidence or what goes in the claims, not what goes in the suit manifest. Although, to the extent that they're related, and we have suit people on the call too, then this is partly a suit interim. Then uh, if there's any relevant pieces in that second part, then we can talk about those too, if there's a relationship. Um, in the TEEP use case where there's TEEP, rats, and suit all used together, then the topology, and there's a slide that I don't have in that deck, but it's in older uh, TEEP slides that were shared with rats and suit both, I think. Um, the uh, TEEP typically, but doesn't have to, it typically uses the background check model where the relying party is the trusted application manager and the verifier is a back end behind the trusted application manager, right? And so, uh, in the TEEP protocol, you send your evidence from the attester to the relying party here, the trusted application manager. The trusted application manager checks with the verifier. The verifier says, ah, you're out of compliance. Uh, or if you're out of compliance, you're out of compliance. And the trusted application manager being the relying party says, oh, you're out of compliance. I guess I will kick off some remediation. And it will use the TEEP protocol, which is the protocol between the attester and the relying party to pass the suit manifest, right? That, that's the topology in the TEEP specific use case. Um, and so what goes in the claims uh, is goes through the relying party or TAM up to the verifier, uh, whatever comes in, the, so it, it, it has those, and then whatever comes in the uh, attestation results is what the uh, remediator, the TAM, is going to use to kick off stuff. And so in a TEEP use case, it would be very common if you have to make a decision on what suit manifest to send to say, I want the information to be in the attesta in the failure attestation results, which may be copied, copying some claims from the evidence. Okay, just to be clear, that says when we put something like a hardware class ID or whatever replaces it in the claims, the expectation is that would be inserted into the attestation results. It might be copied from the claim in the in the evidence, 
and that's what the relying party would use to kick off remediation. So just to be clear that in the original discussions, the assumption was that this claim would be both an evidence and an attestation result. So far, so good. So the, the assertion that I made earlier um, was essentially saying that the attestation evidence does not need to contain any hardware identifier taxonomy. And the reason I say that is because if you are attesting, you have a prior relationship with the verifier. If the verifier has a prior relationship, then it already knows all of the identifiers you might send it, and it can fill in the taxonomies in the attestation results. This reduces the bandwidth between potentially small devices and the, either the relying party in a background check model or the verifier in a passport model. This is not a bad thing, right? We don't actually need to send redundant information. So what are you saying in your example that the verifier would use? So I am saying that most of these identifiers should, in my opinion, be bundled up as a big list of identifiers, not have a hardware identifier and a bootloader identifier and a TEE identifier and another TEE identifier and a TPM identifier. We, we can have you say a what huge you list of taxonomies, but we don't need them. Yeah, just elaborate. When you say T identifier, that's an ambiguous term. Do you mean something like a serial number that's unique to the individual device? Or do you mean a something that is a model number? G give an example. Uh, model numbers uh, um, where you're using soft TEEs, software versions, you know, all these kinds of things can get bundled together to construct a set of different identifiers that are broadly the identifiers that you use for evaluating compatibility, which is why well, I started with compatibility so identifiers that, earlier. To take the Intel example, are you saying that what would be in the evidence would be something like the um, processor model number and the verifier would just have to know which ones are SGX capable? Exactly. Uh, since we actually run such a verifier, I don't like that. And certainly it doesn't do that now. But there's a question of bandwidth, right? I, I go back to that. There's a question and of scalability of the, of the verifier too, but. It, are, so are we suggesting that it's a good idea to ask particular... constrained devices to yeah. make servers lives easier? Is that what you're saying? No, there, I say there's two ends of the spectrum that we have to talk about. Both, both ends are interesting, right? The Intel case in particular is a case which is not really your IoT case. It's your uh, bigger devices that have Intel processors for which bandwidth is probably less of an issue compared to the other end of the spectrum. Okay, And you might have ex very large numbers of it. Technically, you have very large numbers of both ends, right? Your other end is your scaled down case, which is, I think, the case that you're coming from where you have tiny IoT devices, right? Yep. And, and you know... I think that it would be good if rats had a design that did not preclude the use it preclude the use of attestation over constrained networks. Right. So let's take uh, because I, I agree that both cases are interesting and I don't want to preclude either of them. Okay. So in your example, you're talking about what goes in the evidence. Okay. Yep. Even in your example where the evidence itself only contains, you know, the processor um, you know, manufacturer, model number, that type of stuff. And so, you know, I've got a an ST micro, blah, 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 blah. It happens to be Cortex M uh, compliant, but I'm not going to put that in there. I'm just going to say it's an ST micro model number, whatever. Okay. Um, I still believe that even in that case, you still have some attestation results to communicate that to the uh, relying party. So the relying party does not need all that information. All right, because I said the uh, attestation results is what the relying party, the TAM, is going to use, but whether it gets it copied out of the evidence or whether it derives it from other information, like you're saying, if you had other information, the verifier could derive it and say, well, my policy is to insert the uh, Cortex-M compliance um, claim based on my, uh, based on the fact that it supports this ST micro version. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate so that. But I, I was trying to make it a more, a more not general a question. You want it to not be required in the evidence, and I get you there. I'm with you. Yeah. That doesn't change my point about the attestation results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Attestation results probably do need it broken out. I probably do need more detail because the the ultimately the, the entity that is most likely to know this information is the verifier. 
So breaking it out in the attestation results makes sense to me, but um, requiring it in the evidence does not. And, and that is a very good point, sorry to interrupt here, because that is, I, I mean, my sounds like a broken record, but the claims cannot really be defined universally. They, they have a tendency to be evidence claims or attestation result claims and don't make so much sense always when they're in both. So, so unfortunately, just defining a claim can't make it automatically uh, agnostic to where it ends up, I think. I think just about any, almost any claim that you could put in attestation results, you could probably come up with some case where some manufacturer would want to put it into the, the evidence. You know, there's probably some counterexamples. Which sounds dangerous to me if you, if, but it, it would reduce the, the uh, effectiveness of the whole Reds machine, the system, right? Um, you are, you are, you are offloading tasks. Myself. Yeah, it's a policy. I, I see. And in the end, you could just check the, uh, check the uh, signature. <laughs> because then 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 it would put, offload everything to the attester, which is possible and allowed by the architecture, but it reduces the effective means that would establish a uh, set of uh, trustworthiness. Sorry, uh, my my just headphone just died. <laughs> so last comment, just with a TEEP hat on, uh, from the TEEP perspective. The TEEP working group does not care about what the requirements are for the for the evidence because the TEEP protocol never sees the evidence. It's just a pass through, right? The TAM is is it's opaque, right? It's between the attester and the verifier. Yeah. What yeah. TEEP actually depends on is what goes in the attestation results, right? And how you get it, uh, whatever a rat says you should get it, TEEP, that will be okay for the TEEP uh, protocol. So, um, so if, the question: If the attestation results chose to use an identifier that's meaningful to the relying party but not meaningful to the attester, the verifier could make the association between those separate identifiers. That would Correct. be okay. That's what Ren and I were just saying, yeah. That's an implementation detail, but my main point is the TEEP protocol doesn't care. All the TEEP protocol cares about is what goes in the attestation results, because that's the only thing that a TEEP um, entity uses. Of course, you're going to happen to have an attester in the same box as your uh, TEEP agent, and to that extent, but the TEEP protocol itself doesn't see that. It's, it's an opaque blob that it's carried as its payload. So. Okay, so any other questions? We have two other presentations. Uh, Brendan has a presentation and Hank has a presentation. So uh, we have 20 minutes left, so maybe we can go to those presentations. Um, and uh, so I think uh, Brent, Brendan, we can do yours next if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, I, I would be would happy like. to, although it appears that since I don't have the WebEx app installed, I'm not going to be able to share my screen. Uh, I'll share it. Thank you. So this is a very short presentation. So hopefully we'll get some of that time back. Um, essentially, what um, well, Hank and I want to talk about uh, in this is some of the overlap between uh, the RAT suit claims draft and the IETF uh, suit report draft. Next slide, please. So we've got two different drafts. They do have a relationship. Um, they have subtly different uh, reasons for existing, and they define slightly different things. So the suit rats claim draft defines uh, eight claims for suit specific values. The, its sole purpose is for remote attestation. Um, and what it provides essentially is a mapping of suit parameters into eight claims. Uh, the IETF suit report on the other hand has a, or is a reporting format. So to explain what has happened during suit processing uh, it is essentially its its purpose is essentially just for status reporting, uh, post invocation or post installation, and and to report failures in those if they have happened. Um, but it, what it does in it is it specifies a container for parameters that are defined in the suit manifest and any of its extensions. So that uh, essentially is the overlap. It starts looking a bit like um, the rat's claims. Next slide, please. So what we're proposing is that it might make sense to take the, uh, the claims that are already um, composed in suit rats claims 
uh, and put them in within a single claim um, in the relevant section of the suit report. Uh, so that would give you an array of suit parameter sets, uh, one for each suit component. Uh, I guess the details of that probably aren't entirely relevant for the RATS working group, but uh, that's the idea. Next slide, please. And so what that means is that the draft IETF suit report will consume uh, the suit RATS claims document and define one EAT claim, which is essentially this suit system properties claim, and that will contain um, a, an array of any number of um, maps of suit parameters, each one specifying one suit component identifier. And that is essentially it. Um, I think if we did that, we could probably merge those two drafts and define one EAT claim in draft IETF suit report, and that should do the job. Uh, one quick question. Do you envision suit report being the place where the composition happens and um, rats being the place where the claims are defined? I had gotten the impression, correct me if I'm wrong, please, that uh, we could define a claim in suit uh, reviewed by rats and uh, published as a suit draft. Yes, we could do that. I was trying to understand what you were saying when you said that. That, that was the recommendation. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, so the, the, that's where the consumes come in. So the the, the suit report gobbles up the content of the suit rats claim thing that this was starting as the attestation without claims, and then would define each by the, by the especially effectively CWT um, um, claims or one claim effectively. Yes, that's it. That that's the whole presentation. So, any questions? I don't have any objection, but I'm not sure I completely understood it. So that's why. <laughs> well, so the idea essentially is this: right now, uh, the the suit cl rats claims document uh, has a mapping of every suit parameter to a claim, um, and that isn't necessarily how things are going to work. So, it it needs some reworking from that perspective. But on top of that. All of those uh, identifiers are already defined in the suit manifest draft. So having a whole separate definition where they're translated from one kind of um, definition to a claim um, seems like a lot of, of, of extra that may not actually be necessary. And we already have a container format that's defined in the suit report for reporting these things, um, hopefully, in a constrained environment friendly way. So the idea is that we just reuse that container um, and we use the whole container as a single claim. Okay, so I think I understand that. So in, in the uh, suit claim section of the document, and I don't know if, uh, if you're presenting Ned, if you have it or whatever, but I have it up on a different screen on mine, which is the, uh, the table of contents in the suit claim section, there's two categories of claims, which do map to the slide, right? There's a the system properties claims, there's the interpreter record claims. Okay. Um, the interpreter record claims, I get what you're talking about, that makes sense. The system properties claims, I don't know why we still need those. Those seem duplicative with stuff that there's already e-claims for. So we might be able to just remove those and not put those in there in a way, in, in a different way than they already exist in each right now. Um, yeah, that's that's entirely possible. Uh, the, the other that, that was my assumption thing... is the interpreter record claims part of that document would go to suit. The system properties claims would be removed because it was redundant with the eat spec. The only difference being the hardware class identifier that we were just talking about, which is one of those sub bullets. So as long as we agree with what you were there, then I think all the rest of the suit properties claims don't need to be in suit at all. Exactly, but it's very important to understand and make sure that the existing definition of the suit claims that the system property claims in this ID are actually semantic equivalent to what is in it. If they are not, yeah, yeah, and I, that I is agree. the problem I was hinting at at the very beginning. If it's subtly not, that is a problem. Right. My belief you have was a slide you wanted to present, please. Slides I had this. Here's the here's what section here it matches up with which section eat. So I presented that in the previous. I think. I don't remember if it was rats or soup, but in one of the working groups I presented that table before is that my own reading is that, the, that those are incorporated into EAT already. Did you have a slide you wanted to present, Dave? That I um, 
not a slide. Uh, uh, sure, I can present just you sort or of looking at it. There was something uh, you mentioned. Table of contents, so, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, all I'm doing is I'm presenting the table of contents from uh, Draft Burkhol's uh, Suit Rats claims, right? And so in here, here's the list, right? So somewhere yeah. I have a slide that I don't have up right now that had, well, this one matches each section whatever, this one matches each section whatever, or this is the only one that didn't match, and that was where the hardware class ID stuff came from was that section here. Everything else matches. So so I'd like to bring up a, a bit of a um, possible spanner in the works for that. Um, it's completely legitimate in suit to have multiple uh, class and vendor claims per component. Uh, there's there's no problem with that. In fact, it's, it's almost encouraged. Um, I'm not sure how that uh, would map into rats. Um, are you talking about that the following suit manifest is applicable to different sets? You're talking about that on a particular a particular device where I tried to install my report is it succeeded or failed and I was this. Which one did you mean? Uh, both actually. As in in the. Uh, former case, I get it. In the latter case, I don't understand how that could happen unless you actually have different claim sets, in which case it already has that. Right. So that, that's that's the point. You could have a single component that matches seven different classes. And you have one that matches it's tested for vendors. each of them. Sorry? Ignore class identifier for a second. Pick any of the other yep. ones. Okay. <laughs> uh, any, any of the other five on here. I, my belief is this is a singleton per claim set when talking about a report of I tried to install something and either succeeded or failed. Yeah, so I, I mean, maybe, but not necessarily. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because you can come up with uh, interesting constructs like um, you've got a particular version of your updater, which is special specific to the bootloader that's installed on one of your devices. And you haven't had a hardware update, but you've decided to move to a new bootloader. So that's something that you have to check. And the way that you check that has to be done through, say, a vendor identifier, because it's you've got your bootloader from a different vendor, and a version. And so now you've got that, but on top of that, you've also got the compatibility checks for the hardware that you're running on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, so it does yeah. that by having a claim set per component, right? So you have one component for your hardware chip, one component for your bootloader, one component for you know your kernel if you have that many layers, and so on. Yeah, so you again, you're, you've got a huge construct of taxonomies. Yes, I know. Yeah, but, but my point is, within a particular claim set, any particular, any single component would be a singleton value of each of these. Putting class identifier aside for a second. Uh, I mean, how about this? That as of that far to as say any device that has any of the following values, but a particular one only has one. Per as far as image digest and image size go, I agree with you. The okay. others, I'm not certain. Okay, I want you to think about device identifier and vendor identifier because if you do have cases, then this may affect the rats the the rats claim set discussion, right? Where right now, at least a bunch of people have a particular view of how things work and maybe different people have different views because I know there's been some discussion about that, but um, I think Lawrence and I are aligned on this one uh, as to how we think it works. But uh, if you have other things that it doesn't work for, we got to modify our thinking. We'd love to hear that from a rat's perspective. But class identifier is the only one that's interesting to say, well, if I got a processor or a component that is compliant with multiple specs, just to use the, uh, the, the, the terminology that, um, that I had before, maybe I'm compliant with both um, the ARM V8 uh, architecture and a particular global platform spec, for example. How could I do that? Okay, would I do that in two different claim sets? And this was what I was alluding to earlier when I said, would you have multi one, multiple claim sets or multiple values or what? And I'm not sure there. You certainly need the ability to specify one, right? Whether you need the ability to specify multiple, I'm open to that. So, yeah. So my my argument is you probably need to specify multiple. Um, and and you gave a great example. Um, I, I mean, there there are others, but we don't necessarily need in to get into that In the same claim right set now. versus in different claim sets is the question that I have. Because if this is the only example of multiple values in the same claim set, then it just means you want to claim with uh, multiple values in it, as opposed to you know um, having it be a general thing in, in, in each or whatever. You say, hey, you have a, a claim that can have a list of stuff, right? A list of opaque values. So. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah, okay. that's, all, that's all I want to say. I'll have to think about that one some more. I don't know. Lawrence, please speak up if you have other views there, but I, I, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm echoing the discussions you and I previously had, so. 
I mean, this, this whole thing seems like a discussion of how to specify software compatibility. Um, and that seems like a suit topic to me. Um, you know, if there are clear claims that there is clear agreement on that are broad in general for lots of software update and other use cases, then we can put them in the eight document. But, um, you know, I mean, I understand a lot of the design things and, you know, like part of these design seems like there's some good things in that. And, but it sounds like a software update uh, thing, not a really general purpose eat thing. And, and so, and, you know, eat claims, uh, you can, anybody can define, you know, eat claims or CWD claims and lots of working groups and standardize them and publish them and use them this way, use them that way. That That's all fine. There's no, there's nothing particularly magic about it, something having to go in the eat document. So at this point, um, I'm, uh, my preference would be none of this goes in the eat doc. In, in, yeah, none of this goes in the eat document. Um, and then we, in particular, we don't hold up eat any further for any, for this. You know, unless... uh, I, I completely agree. I mean, for, for the record, I was suggesting that we uh, move a document that's currently active in rats out of rats. Okay. And we have to make sure that the system property claims that are in the uh, document that are moved out are semantically equivalent to the uh, claims in each. And if not, we have to make that very clear when we define additional claims or the different information elements first that are already defined uh, in, in suit, we, the, the finition is done. Um, but if they're not equivalent, or it says to be not equivalent, that there has to be a note in the report that this is equivalent. This can be used as in, used in the RETS uh, um, agitation result, but this is not the same as this. So this, we will spell this out in suit, I assume. So um, what I'm really interested in the most is that the claims that are in the in the current eat draft, whether uh, they need any modification or clarification. Or use here. That yeah. my, that's my number one priority. And I think that's only three one, three ones. It's, it's a, a device, vendor, and version. This is the three okay. ones that we just have to, to spin off like half an hour, really look at them in a small group discussion, uh, as a breakout a design team, whatever, and, and then come back with, yes, this is the same thing. Go ahead. Yeah. So five so, of them in the document. Can I please finish? I haven't said very much here. Uh, uh, so the, the claims I would be interested in are uh, UUID or UEID, um, uh, hardware vendor, that's uh, or hardware OEM, um, hardware model, and hardware version. So that's the th the, the things there: hardware, uh, hardware OEM, hardware model, and hardware version. Uh, those are the, the the existing claims that I think need some discussion and, and might be relevant here or might not. So that's so that's a hardware vendor, not um, not a tester vendor. So, so so I think it sounds like there's an item to go to do have that discussion. I don't know if we can have that in the last three minutes of this meeting. Uh, but so so I think that what's on the table is whether where that discussion should happen should it happen in rats or should it happen in suit uh, if there if it's about the are, main eat claims it should happen in rats and that should happen soon and quick and be focused on the the general use case for them not you know uh, how, how suit uses them but also very generally how it how they fit together is that do others share the same view this is Russ. That makes sense to me. And I think that, uh, but from the suit uh, charter perspective, where it says one of the two groups will take the lead on um, the document that's going to explain how uh, firmware update status is handled, I think we're suggesting that part goes in suit, dependent as much as it can on each uh, clean definitions. Sounds like what we need is a proposal that gets specific about which which suit claims and which eat claims are uh, that require discussion, and, and then a proposal for which working group to have that discussion in. 
That's what I was trying to share in that table of contents, right? My yeah. belief from this discussion is that um, five of the sections in uh, the Burkholz document uh, go to rats because they're general. I mean, the system properties claims other than hardware class, right? The, the other five there. They don't match one to one because it just so happens in EAD, it covers like three of those in one, I meaning they're combined into a, uh, in, into a causewit. Um, but those five sections go out of there and would not need to be defined in suit, but can be discussed in suit to Russ's point. It says, how would you use those in a software context that can define the other ones? Is there a question as to, I think there's another question, maybe I'll just throw it out there, which is, does any of this uh, uh, tie into whether or not the draft should be adopted by one of the other working groups? Okay. Well, the for simplicity, it's like, I have to... oh, hold on, I'm trying to capture in the notes, because I, I thought we were talking about two drafts. One that's in suit yeah. and one that's in rats. Yes. Yeah. And why is the eat spec? Yeah. It, it, Lawrence has explained that the eat spec, he listed a specific things, EUID and so on, that uh, people should read down themselves and verify there's no gaps in there, right? And that's the, the five sections that I refer to are the ones that I personally claim that do map and that the eat spec is fine. But uh, others should do that. You know, Hank and folks should do their own checking and make sure they can't spot something that's missing. Dave, could you spark a, a side by side table thingy on the list, and everybody can then comment on this? Like, like I don't know. Yes, I agree. A is B, and C is D, and Y yeah. is not Z. Yeah, uh, yes, then, then not because this is that I've yeah. shown before. I will dig it up and post the table. Sure. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Because then we can continue this basically top of the hour now. And to, to clarify that, <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to do this as a chair. I think that discussion needs to be cross for now until we make a final decision, meaning the discussion should be joined in both rats and suit. Yeah. And we've, uh, perhaps the three way, right, include TEEP as well. I would accept Dave as the TEEP arbiter that pulls TEEP in if necessary, but we can also use the third one now. At least uh, when we come to a conclusion, uh, we should present the conclusion to TEEP. Yeah, but but I think personally, there has to be a merge. Doing this in two documents is super confusing. My brother, Brenton and I tried this and we were frustrating ourselves. So so the, 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 I think it's a fact that they have to merge where they end up in the end um yeah that is a future decision okay let's have the discussion first all right so we're top of the hour over the hour um yeah then i we have, go to my we, thank you all. We, yeah so i think we can close the meeting now unless there's uh any last minute discussion that needs to be out and there as a poor note taker <laughs> I, <laughs> I suggest Especially Dave, you speak so fast that I couldn't capture everything. <laughs> so you guys may want to go through the Chromium B or Hedge Doc and clean up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So uh, we'll uh, close the meeting for now. Um, thank you, everybody. See you soon. Maybe in the uh, architecture editor meeting. Bye bye.